first, I want to say thank you uh, for all of you being here today to contribute to this very important conversation, normalizing language and identification of being people who are in recovery, uh, recovering from addiction, substance use disorder, and doing so in a space where you know, there's very much a need for more of a face and a voice in the music world. Um, so really greatly appreciate, appreciate you all being here. Um, so my name is Brendan Berry. I'm a client manager on the mental health and addiction services team at Music Cares. Music Cares has been so gracious to allow us to be here today and have this conversation just to let you all and anyone who's watching this know a little bit more about Music Cares. We are the charitable nonprofit branch of the Grammys and we are pretty much a safety net for anyone and everyone that's a professional working in the music industry. So that's, you know, artists, but not just artists. It could be people who are on the management side, the business side of music. It could be, you know, lighting crew. Um, it could be tour bus drivers. Anyone who's a professional in the music industry, we are here to help you. We have three branches under the umbrella of Music Cares. Our human services team helps with basic living expenses. So like, if your tour bus gets broken into and all of your stuff gets stolen, we will help pay for those things to be replaced. If you're having a tough time paying your rent, we will help you pay your rent. If you need help, need help paying for your car, we can help you make your car payment, pay for your car insurance so you can continue to get to your gigs. We have a health services team that helps pay for any sort of medical treatment that you're receiving. We live in a, in a society where healthcare is not very affordable. So, you know, to know that we're here to help out music professionals can be an enormous asset. Um, and then the, the department that I work in um, that is near and dear to my heart, mental health and addiction services, anyone in the music industry that is struggling with their mental health, substance use disorder, um, don't know where to go, not sure what to do, just really scared, uh, feeling like you need help but what do I do? We are professionals here to help guide you, whether that's simply just paying for some of your therapy, whether that's helping you get into treatment, if that's inpatient treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, um, if it's finding a coach, if it's finding the right fit to support you with whatever your unique needs are and the things that you're struggling with. Um, so we help find you the right providers, the right treatment, and then we help pay for it. Um, so really, really important work that we get to do, and we're very passionate about it. Um, and then some other stuff that we do is, is have conversations with amazing artists like you all. And again, in this instance, trying to put a face and a voice to recovery. Um, I myself have 17 years in long-term recovery, uh, also a music professional. I compose for film and television, um, won a Grammy a couple years ago. So for me, it's, it's really cool to be a part of this conversation with you. Uh, for a variety of reasons, a lot of identification. Um, but I wanted to kick it off now and introduce uh, our amazing panelists and our, our host today. So we have Will Dog Abers, who is uh, the bassist and founding member of the multi Grammy award winning band Ozo Motley. He played in the Latin rock supergroup Los Super Seven, and Will Dog is also a very accomplished film and TV composer. We have Darren Waller, Pro Bowl NFL tight end, artist and producer who just released his incredible LP Walking Miracle. And then our host for today is the amazing Elia Einhorn. He's the creator of Sober 21, which inspired these panels. Uh, he's also the host of Pitchfork Radio and TV and Sonos Radio. And with that, I'll kick it off or pass it over to Elia. Brandon, thank you so much for that beautiful intro, man, and for everything you do at Music Cares, for real. Um, I'm so psyched to be here with you all. Darren, welcome to the show. Where are you joining us from? Oh, man, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm in Las Vegas right now so I'm at the house, so uh, I'm grateful to be here. Nice. And Will Dog, thanks for being here, man. Where are you coming in from? Yeah, thanks for having us and me. Um, I'm in Los Angeles right now, sunny LA. Finally got some sun. Nice. And we saw earlier, you just stepped out on the back porch, but you're in the studio even. Yeah, I was in the studio. I have a, a friend of mine actually is here from Brooklyn. 
that I produced his last record, Sonny Singh, and uh, he's out here for two days. So I, we just decided to get it going again. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, glad he's visiting from where I'm at out here yeah. in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. Guys, as we're sitting down to tape this, it's the top of spring. And Darren, you just released the incredible LP, Walking Miracle. It opens with this powerful spoken word. And I wonder if you could share a few lines of that with us. Uh, yeah, no doubt. Um, it, it, one of the couple lines from it would be, um, you know, my old diet consisted of alcohol and painkillers, but somehow the high of it only made the pain realer amplified to the point where I can't decide what's real and what's fantasy. You understanding me? I didn't think so. And it just goes off from there into, you know, the depths of my thoughts and emotions and everything that's kind of come from my using and my recovery and trying to find some clarity from it. It gets powerful really quick. And, you know, I was walking through Fort Greene Park listening to it when the record dropped and I thought, I've got to ask him, what made you feel confident sharing that level of openness and of and of honesty and of vulnerability in your music um i think that that level of vulnerability and honesty comes from you know the the rooms and the the meetings and the groups that we've all been a part of and had the opportunity to to share in because it just builds repetition and gives you calluses in those things and it just makes recovery groups. Yeah, it makes you a part of uh, of your character. So now it's just, just like me having a normal conversation. Me, uh, basic expression is me just kind of pouring it all out there. And it still may, you know, step on people's toes a little bit or have people be like, "Whoa, like he really said that. But that's just the kind of language that we use now to keep us in this place that uh, we've been trying to find for so long. I wonder if you've had uh, positive and or negative reactions to sharing this well, what's it been like for you since the record dropped uh yeah it's been a mixture for sure it's been a lot of uh people that are you know impressed by you know the spoken word and some of the records that i've put out and finding out that i make a lot of the beats now um but then there's also the the crowd of people that's like get back on the football field you don't give a fuck about your <laughs> career because you're making oh, music man. while you're injured and so it, it's it's a mixture of those two. So uh, I appreciate the people and I appreciate them, you know, having an opinion, you know, that's what, that's what music is about. I just put it out there to the world and I feel like music is meant to be shared and let people uh, decide how they feel off that. There's always gonna be haters out there, but it's, I mean, it's so powerful to see people in, in the comments on your post talking about how it resonates with them, you know? And uh, I mean, that's so much of what we make music for, right? It's It's to connect with other people. Yeah, I try to I try to make sure, you know, I can give some people something they can relate to. You know, I don't want to be somebody that people look to, but I'm too far out of reach by the career that I have or the things that I do on a day to day basis. I want to let them know that, you know, I'm successful, but at the same time, I'm a human being like my thoughts and my anxieties and my the, the some of the pressure and the stress I feel is no different than what you feel on a day to day basis. Um, and, you know, I hope and I hope that gives people hope. That's it, man. That's it. We'll talk, we got to talk about Oza Motley for a minute, man, because, you, well, a couple reasons. One is I got the chance to play with you guys at a festival uh, many years ago, and it, you guys put on this insanely high energy, very like party centric show. It was beautiful. And there was a lot of joie de vivre. The crowd was going nuts. This was in Chicago somewhere. And I've noticed, you know, that party vibe often means that it's going to come with alcohol and drugs in the crowd, you know, and sometimes in the band too. I wonder, how do you personally deal with that, Will Dog? Um, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. I don't know what joie de vivre is. Uh, <laughs> Joy of life. <laughs> oh, thank you. And yeah, uh, just back to what Darren, Darren was saying, man, I mean, you inspired me, like just hearing his opening, like, yeah, like he said, he wants to inspire people like you inspire me. So thank you for that, man. Like, seriously, um, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, I mean, my drug use and alcoholism, it doesn't come from me being a musician or being touring. You know, I was I always knew when I was a kid what who I was and what I was. I mean, my 
my dad took me to a concert when I was six years old. I remember the first time smelling weed in a crowd, in a concert. I think I was at a Gil Scott Heron concert or The Clash. Whoa. I can't remember which one. Um, but, uh, and I remember thinking, whatever that is, I'm doing that. Like I knew right away, like when I smelled that shit for the first time, I was like, I am doing whatever that is. I love that already. Like I could tell, you know, and, um, and so as like time goes on, I think, I think for me, like me being, um, you know, how I was raised or, you know, and me having to, you know, raise myself at an early age. I had I had enough hustle in life to um, my desire to make it or survive in the world was bigger than my drug addiction at the time or my, you know, um, right at the time. What what happened was once I made it like in my mind, once I had my house, uh, once I had, you know, the first Grammy, I remember um, we won our first Grammy and I told myself, I'm not doing drugs today, right? Like just this one day, like it's the Grammys. We didn't think we were going to win, you know, at all. Um, we, we were the last people to think that we were going to win. And so we went just like, well, we'll go to have fun. But we ended up winning. And I, I, I remember driving. I mean, I lived two miles from Staples Center, you know. I, I drove straight to my dealer like literally right after and straight home and I was home alone in this house and at that time we had these things called two ways it was like right when before cell phones they were like you could email each other it was like they were called a two-way it was like a pager but you could email like full conversations like texting and everyone was like yo Stevie Wonder's playing at this party where are you at dog like to me you know and I'm in my house like doing drugs um, by myself. So I think where, where it got really bad for me was, wasn't, it wasn't the crowds or the, the, um, it was me being alone with myself after I had done everything that I was supposed to do in life. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. I, not only that, but like all the teachers growing up, you're never going to make it as a musician, you're not good enough. Like I wasn't good. I wasn't a good musician in high school or, and you know, I dropped out of high school pretty early, but like in junior high, I was a horrible musician. So everyone was telling me like, you're not going to be able to make it. You're not good enough, you know? And so part of that is in there too, where I have this like desire to like show them wrong. But then when I do, that is still in my head that I'm not good enough, that I'm that I'm less than everyone else and that I don't really deserve any of the shit anyway. So now it's time for me to do go back to when I was a kid. Um, you know, when I was a kid, we were homeless for my uh, middle school years. You know, we lived in vehicles and buses and I had a stepfather that was on crack that we didn't know what crack was at that time. But I always saw myself as a person with a shopping cart eventually in life, like walking down the street, living on the streets. I'm either going to be living on the streets in jail or dead. Like that's like really was my vision for my future after I make it, you know? And so that that's been the hardest, I think, challenge. It wasn't like the making it part. It was like once I make it now, you know? And so that's kind of like what I've been dealing with. And I, you know, luckily I have not, had drugs or alcohol for 20 years now. So, um, you know, so life's, yeah, yeah. Life's way different. And, um, but, but it's still there, you know, it's still there and it comes and goes and yeah, just dealing with the, the anxiety of that, you know, of all that, that, you know, Darren was talking about just as being a human in this world and the society is, yeah. So. There's something profound in the fact that both of you kind of came out of the gate sharing about some beautiful successes, but about how addiction is something that doesn't respect successes. It doesn't care. It just doesn't care. And, uh, you know, both of you guys have experienced these big setbacks, these big losses from active addiction. And I wonder if you could talk briefly, maybe, in a minute or two about that moment when you hit bottom 
and the light came on and you wanted to make a change. Darren, you want to um, kick it off? Yeah, I can start. Um, you know, for me, I started using, I started with painkillers, moved to weed and alcohol when I was 15. And then um, this went through college, through the league, you know, and then um, I got a suspended from the league, banned from the league for a year was the words that they used. And uh, this was 2017 in June. And, and that was for uh, coming up dirty? Yeah, consistently. I mean, you're talking about hundred. I was just failing every drug test on purpose, just self-sabotaging, wanting to put myself out. So I just didn't even want to be there anymore. Didn't think I deserved it. And um, I got suspended in June. I was still using for two months after that. And then I overdosed in August, August 11th, 2017 um, in Baltimore. That was my first team uh, right around the corner from the practice facility. I was about to move out and move home. Uh, with my parents and uh so that was an experience that kind of shook me and rattled me because I thought I could manipulate everything I thought I had everything under control up to that point you know my ego was still intact but at that point it was just kind of leveled completely almost and it was a way for God to kind of step in and give me guidance and to and from there I went to rehab and um you know with no expectation of ever playing football again but just to you know really find myself and take time to focus and find who I was because I didn't know who I was. I was hiding behind the success. I was hiding behind the notoriety and that got me nowhere. It just left me feeling more empty, kind of like Will Dog said. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about my story. Will Dog, can you share your moment of uh, the light going on? I, you know what, it, it was never a light. I think what it was, was I, you know, other than like the only thing that really was acceptable in my band you know, we were we were a touring band. There was, you know, six original members and then we had a few. The only thing that was really acceptable was weed in our community, right? Like if you smoke weed, you're cool, right? Like whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even some drinking, but anything outside of that wasn't it was kind of frowned upon um, in my band. And so I always hid my hard drug use from my band and from my community because it was like, that's the worst thing you could do. You know, I felt like whatever I was doing, you know, and I don't know if you guys feel like this, like whatever you're doing is the worst shit you could do, right? So like, yeah. that's in me, like the drug I'm doing is the worst thing. It's so dirty, you're, you know, and like, and so I would hide it. Um, and I think- and Can I just say quickly ahead. that yeah. also Motley, you're a hard touring band. Like this isn't just hiding for one or two shows. No, you guys yeah. are on the road like 150 shows a year at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. And they would never expect me. You know, I would go out in the middle or, you know, and also when I was on the road, I was able to maintain away from like the hard drugs mostly until I got home and I had time off. Then I would go hard, you know, until I would leave again. But I, I always told myself, as long as I'm not affecting them, that I could live with myself. I'm killing myself, but as long as I'm not affecting this. So I was showing up to everything. And it wasn't until I literally missed an interview on a radio station, you know, was where the guilt of their families, their lives. Now I was affecting them, you know, and that's where I, 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 I had enough strength in that moment to call my band to my house. And I called my band all, all over and they, I'm like, I just need you to come over. I'm like crying on the fucking phone. And I'm like, and I just said, need to come in. So I told them, I said, Hey man, like I'm, I am an, an addict. I, I can't stop using this drug. You know, I cannot stop. And they were like, Oh shit. Okay. Um, and uh, then my manager came over. And my manager was like, tell me right now, crying, um, crying on the phone, tell me right now, dog, what's going on? She thought I was going to tell her I had AIDS or something, you know, um, that's what she said later. But I ended up telling her and she went into action and my manager found Music Cares, found Music Cares and they, and this was September 12th or October 12th. I remember because it was my dad's birthday and he had passed. So it was. October 12th and the and Harold Owens that was at music cares told my manager make a deal with dog give him three months 
And if he can't quit in three months on his own, that he can go, he'll go to rehab. So I made the deal. Literally three months and a week later, I got arrested. So the writing was on the wall. Like I couldn't. <laughs> and not only that, I was supposed to go to Australia three days later or four days later. And so I spent a couple nights in jail. And then luckily they got it. The judge agreed to let me go to Australia on tour if I agree to go straight to a program when I get back. And that's how it happened. And I got off the plane from Australia, went straight to, um, you know, to uh, I went to Impact in Pasadena, uh, which is a, a rehab out here. And I spent I was there for a month and a half. And um, yeah, man. And I've been clean since. Not not like, oh, it's been easy. No. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like it's been, it's been hard, man. It's not easy. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, man. It's the hardest thing. Yeah. I'm going to circle back to that about what it takes day to day to stay sober. But I do find it interesting that both of you guys share experiences that rehab was a springboard for you to continued recovery. And I had the same experience. You know, I was blessed to get, um, access to rehab back in 97 when i hit hit a bottom where i legitimately thought i was insane and going to be institutionalized for the rest of my life from uh drink and drug and um and i learned a lot in rehab i think one of the biggest lessons for me was um that you need a sober community outside of rehab once you graduate but i, I want to kick it back to you guys um either to answer separately or in discussion what what were one or two takeaways that each of you learned in that foundational period? Um, in rehab, the biggest takeaway for me that I felt was most valuable was um, just the ways in which I create time for stillness and reflection. Uh, because up until that point in my life, I feel like I've been, you know, going from one goal to the next, trying to get things done, trying to make money, trying to be successful, that there was really no stopping and uh, evaluating why I was doing certain things, what the purpose behind my actions were, like, you know, really the getting down to the why of things. And so learning how to meditate, um, implementing journaling, um, getting into these groups and environments where, you know, we discuss our feelings instead of suppressing them and trying to move on as a sign of strength. Um, but learning that strength is really sharing and putting those things out there for people around us to see and really to connect with um, because like you said like I'm I'm a natural isolator like even to this day I'm almost six years uh, in recovery and it's like I'm still want to isolate from people you know I'm newly married I still have times and urges to where I want to just isolate and be alone for no good reason because I just I still think that's a safe place for me when it's really not it's really the easiest place for you know my disease and the enemy to just get a hold of me so um, but the thing that I learned the most that was most valuable for me was learning to sit and reflect and also to lean on the people around me in consistent, uncomfortable conversation. Mm. Will Dog, what really stuck with you from rehab, man? Gosh, uh, rehab, man, was uh, I think the, the, the main thing that like stuck with me, I think, is like don't use no matter what like no matter what that was like the one thing and then also to yeah like the, i think the thing about the isolation part that darren's talking about is also is like before you use reach out to somebody before you use and um i think that that's helped me multiple times i, I remember the first time um that you know i got a spot my first sponsor um in 12-step program and and I made this deal, I'll call you before I do it, right? I'll call you. So I was six months sober and I was out on the street. I went to the old neighborhood where I used to purchase and I'm in my car and I go, okay. And I dialed a number and I called sponsor. I'm like, hey man, he's like, what's up? I'm like, um, he's like, oh, where, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, well, I'm out here on the street, um, you know, where I used to buy. And he's like, oh, and I expect him to say, get the fuck out of there, man. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. right? Like, I thought I was going to yeah. yell at me, right? And he was like, oh, okay, well, why are you there? I was like, I just wanted to see if the dealers were still here. <laughs> and he said, 
are they? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, I guess you can go home now. <laughs> and that was like, that was like, and I was just, and that just like broke the ice. Like for me, it was just like, yeah, you're right. I could go home right now. And like I did. And <laughs> it was just, uh, but yeah, Hell yeah, I think humans that we need each other that we need each other, man. We do. We're humans. We're, we belong to a community. There's a bigger, there's a, you know, like, yeah, I don't know if you, you experience this, but I can just look at people on the street and I know them already. Like I have this, like, I have this, like, I feel like I have a connection to everybody, you know, like, especially when I'm in the elements that, you know, Darren's talking about too, about you know, if you, when I meditate, when I get, when I get centered with myself, that's where I'm like, I'm connected to everybody and everything. And that's the part of life. That's like, that's the realness of, of, of what we get, you know, from being um, on this journey, you know, those are the gifts. Addiction can be a disease of isolation. I mean, you guys are both touching on this and, and the community having community is so so powerful um i want to throw it to you brendan just for a second because you know dog talked about his experience with music cares helping him out directly i also had a guy who i've been working with in brooklyn who's in this music industry was referred to me by a sober uh music publicist and and they said it's a guy who's worked at some labels that you know and who uh needs some help. Can you talk to the guy? And I said, yeah, man, let's get dinner. Let's talk. And um, we did. And he mentioned to me that uh, randomly didn't even know you and I knew each other. He said, there's a guy named Brendan at Music Cares who's helping me get into rehab. And I, you know, I had a little shiver, you know, it's, uh, there's Music Cares again, where we need you all. I wonder what that looks like for you. Like, how do folks come to you all to ask about that? And what's that process like, you know, for people who are maybe watching now and thinking, I maybe I need this. How do they do that? Yeah, definitely. Um, appreciate the question. And I remember when uh, he told me that he was going to be linking up with you, I was like, Oh, man, yeah, I know Elia. I know that group of people. <laughs> it's an incredible yeah. group of, of sober artists out in Brooklyn. So I was super stoked that he was getting linked up there. Uh, when folks come to us, they can either send an email to our relief mailbox, or they can call the number uh, on our website and they'll get connected with one of our client managers, one of our managing, managing directors, and we'll have a heart to heart. You know, we, we try to approach every single client understanding that they have unique needs, that, you know, everyone's got unique backgrounds. And so we want to assess where you're at now, where you've been in your life and, where we want to help guide you moving forward and allowing you to be a central part of making that decision as well. So once we've established what's currently happening and how can we assist you, then we start working with the providers that we have connections with all over the country. So we have treatment centers that have been so gracious to offer us some incredible scholarships and music cares will, will foot the bill. Um, you know, so we'll figure out like, what is the best treatment center for you, your, again, your unique needs as an individual, what all, whatever your background is. And, and then once you're, you're in treatment, you know, you're in some of the best hands that we could possibly uh, hope to put you in. So it's, it's something that we understand also, there can be a really narrow window when it comes to alcoholism, addiction, substance use disorder. Yep. You know, I'm sure, you know, you all can speak to your experiences, but I know for myself, those moments where it's like, all right, I got a problem and I need help. And that might last for five seconds, you know, <laughs> like that, that moment of desperation, that feeling of despair. And then there's times where it's like, I'm down and I'm beat. And I, and I, you know, both Will Dog and Darren, you both really talked eloquently about those moments where you hit bottom and what it was for you. But when those moments happen, reaching out to those people in your life who you trust and respect, who care about you, you know, in your cases, you had some folks who were still there for you. So to be able to have them to lean on. And then I really appreciated you talking about, you know, the, the uh, desire to isolate, but still creating community for yourselves and talking about those tools 
that you were able to pick up early on, those people that helped support you early on. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to ask both of you is, um, you know, I, in early sobriety, it, it can be so difficult just to manage what's going on up here. And it can be so difficult to manage what's going on here, but life still happens. And, you know, both of you were successful creators, successful professionals in your respective industries. And, and so uh, could, I was wondering if you could give some examples of maybe how you were able to, you know, integrate the tools that you were learning and the people were helping to support you while you re connected with your professions and, and how you're able to continue showing up for life and music and, and sports. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the first example that pops into my head, especially with, uh, getting back into the game of football was, uh, you know, you hear the cliche one day at a time in 12 step recovery, but, um, just how simple, uh, that approach is and you can apply it to anything. It allows you to show up and really be present there. Um, I remember, when I, I worked at Sprouts Farmer's Market once I got back from rehab and then there was a point where I felt like, you know, through my relationship with uh, my higher power that it was time for me to start training again and get back into, into football. And this was early 2018 and um, my, my trainer had been on me to get back out there and, you know, get back into it. You know, because, you know, he believed in me. When I didn't believe in myself still having some 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 game left. And uh, we split this field with a high school seven on seven team in Atlanta. And uh, we used like 20 yards of the field, convinced them to let us use it uh, on the weekends to uh, do like route running drills and do like cone drills and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's such a far cry away from a, a full 80,000 seat NFL stadium and you know, playing in a big game or making a lot of money and stuff like that. Like I'm literally on this field where we had to convince the this high school team to let us use some of it just to get some work in. But I wasn't thinking about what it looked like or, you know, if I would ever get back to playing in the league again, or it was just like, I'm here. I say that I, I'm supposed to go back into the game while I need to work on my skills. And all I can really do is control this day on this field like one drill at a time like one step at a time one movement at a time and, and having a precise focus like that and then you know translating coming back into my first full season in the league was 2019 and the first year as a starter it's like I ended up having uh 1100 yards that year and, just, and like going on to be like you know one of the best seasons that a person in my position has had you know, on the team and, you know, in the league. And um, it wasn't because I went into it saying, I'm going to have this, 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 and this. It was really just taking the approach of, you know, one, I can do this one drill to the best of my ability. I can have one period and practice the best of my ability, which turns into a, a practice that is my best, which would turn then turn into a week of practice that's my best, which turns into a game where I'm performing my best, all because right where I'm at, I'm keeping it simple um, and not trying to place all these expectations on myself or my performance, but just giving my all that I have in this moment. And it all spawns from one day at a time. You know, I got clean and, you know, a certain fellowship and it's like, you know, I got just for today on my wrist. And it's like, you know, for, to keep me in the moment because that's where I'm at my best. If I'm too far in the past, I'm guilty. I'm ashamed. If I'm too far in the future, I'm anxious and I'm worried. But if I'm in the day and if I'm present to whatever it is that's called me to do, then uh, I'm going to be the best version of myself. And that's translated into my music as well. I've had moments where I'm like, I want to make things that people will like, or like that, or that is what's, that's what's popping right now. And it's like, those, those songs never happen. They not, not a word comes out, not a word gets on paper, you know, but when it's something, when I make the music that I'd like to hear or that I like to create those things flow naturally and I can just be in the moment and allow those, um, songs to take shape and, and, and take place. So those are a couple of examples of just that one principle of recovery, you know, playing into my life and allowing me to really create a life I never thought I would ever have. Amazing. Well, Doc, how about you? Uh, yeah, man, uh, for me, it's, it goes back to, you know, my band, man, they, when I, 
we had when I was coming out of rehab, they brought my whole band in and they said, you know, you guys got to support this guy. You know, he's, uh, you know, so we they made a deal. Um, and I'm so I'm so grateful um, to them. They made a deal to have a dry bus. You know, no alcohol was allowed on the bus, no weed smoking on the bus, um, you know, and, and you know what's interesting about that? Other people have in my group have gotten um, sober since then. And since then, we've we don't we have a dry dressing room to this day, you know, um, and that was 20 years ago. So uh, and we're about to celebrate 28 years on the first together. So most of our time together is, you know, us working on this, um, you know, and together. And so that's the thing is like, yeah, having people, man, having a su su people around you that are supportive. I don't think I, I would have been able to do it, honestly. I would have had to pick a, a different career, you know, definitely. I can piggyback on that, dog. I mean, for me, it was really important to have uh no drugs on tour rule and uh you know the band would drink um once in a while someone would get into some other stuff and it would get back to me you know but i figured look as long as this rule is in place and 98 percent of the time there's no drugs you know like immediately in our dressing room you know in the van in the hotel room I can work with this, you know, and, but, but it was foundational. I don't think I could have stayed sober through 10 years of touring. If there had been uh, drugs on the road like that, you know, just for me, just for me sharing my experience. And, um, and the truth is it starts to become a situation where it's like, well, if there's someone who can't work with that rule, maybe you need to examine having that person as part of the touring unit, because it may not be uh, a healthy enough situation. Um, I want to circle back to something that we kind of put a pin in earlier in the conversation, which is the work that it takes to stay sober day to day, right? We kind of went back in time and talked about that foundational period in rehab, just coming out of rehab. What about now? You know, you guys mentioned that each of you has years sober. I know that Brendan and I do as well, and it's still a, a daily thing. I wonder what it looks like for, for everybody on the call now, day to day, staying sober. How's that manifest in your life? Um, I'll say for me, first and foremost, it's a relationship with God who I've come to know through uh, the steps. And it's, um, you know, one of the steps talks about um, improving conscious contact with that higher power. And it's like, how am I improving upon that every day through the conversations that I have, whether I'm in my car or if I'm, you know, going to work or whatever I'm doing, like, am I collaborating with uh, God and everything that I'm doing and, and walking in all the principles of the steps? And so it's continuing to read literature, it's continuing to write in my journal, do gratitude lists. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, watching sermons deepens my relationship um, with God, you know, uh, continuing to go to the meetings. I go do a zoom on Tuesday evenings and I go to an in-person meeting on Thursday. So it's continuing to just be around guys, meet with my sponsor once a week, like just really the fundamentals, um, and not growing complacent or, um, seeing them as mundane, but really seeing the, the vitality of them and the fact that I have to continue in them. So it's nothing really all that miraculous, but it's really just the fundamentals of, maintaining a relationship with God um, and allowing that to empower me to, you know, be of service too, which is a big one, you know, um, serving in any capacity, whether it's giving time, money, any kind of resource um, given through my foundation. Um, but it's really just the relationship with God, and it, which inspires me to serve. And then when I serve, I, I, I feel better about myself and it allows me to, you know, realize and remember, um, why this is the best decision that I ever made and just to continue walking on the path. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the same for me, man, is what Darren's saying is like, yeah, meetings, 
uh, humans interaction with humans, not, you know, it's like, uh, the opposite of whatever the opposite of isolation is that, you know, uh, for, yeah, it's like, it's becoming more about human beings, uh, as I'm, as like a, drugs are still an option, right. To do alcohol and drugs, but there's many steps that at this point that I'd have to do before I go back to that, you know? Um, and so for me, it's more like, am I connecting with my wife too? You know, am I, am I, am I, is there a level of into, am I allowing levels of intimacy into my life with other human beings? Right. Cause that's, that's the first sign for me is I'm not allowing levels of intimacy with other human beings. So that's like the start. And like, that's the, that's the check that I do every day with myself is like, um, am I, am I engaging in life with other human beings in an honest and open way? Um, you know, cause without that, I start to become an asshole. So that's first, right. I become like a jerk where I'm hiding something or I'm like, you know, not open because I'm too scared to say whatever's or, or I'm unfamiliar with the feeling and that's scary. I can't quite understand. I'm not smart enough or whatever. There's this feeling that I have that's like so attached to me as a baby that I don't know how to even get it out, like and communicate it to people. I'm so scared of what it is. Um, yeah. So those kind of things is like where I check, where I, you know, fine. Just kind of call. Like I called somebody today that I that uh, I haven't that we're kind of been on the rocks and I've been hiding from, you know, and I called somebody today on the way in. I just called them and left a message. I doubt they want to talk to me right now. I get it, but I still reached out. I still made that, that extra, that effort that that's really scary for me, man. Like I got to be honest, it's so scary. I, it's so much easier for me to just like, I'm not talking to that person ever again, like my bad, you know, and I'm, you know, like, I, I hurt them through my words at some point in life. And like, I don't talk to them. Like I have a lot of people like that in my life that I need to, and now that I'm 50, that's my goal this decade is to get all that back. You know, I just turned 50 in February and my goal now is like, screw all that, screw all that. From now on, it's like, I am going to mend or attempt to mend all those relationships in my past that that have been on my mind that I hold that keep me down that keep me in this place that I'm so comfortable being which is depression and you know and that's the comfortable place because I can control all that right like I can this 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 element of like reaching out taking responsibility this is like an element that's like uncontrollable for me does that make sense like and that's the fear that's the fear part of this like yeah, for me, it's I'm so scared of this, man. I can't tell you, man. Oh, it man. makes real sense. I mean, you're talking about and Darren, you're talking about interrogating those thoughts that bring us back to old patterns, you know, and, and when we notice starting to get into those old patterns, stepping out of it instead of continuing down that road. Brendan, I wonder if you'd feel comfortable sharing with us what your day to day experience is staying sober these days. Yeah, for sure. I uh, really relate with both uh, Will Dog and Darren here. I mean, talking about just the importance of first being honest with yourself and then being honest with other people. Um, those for me became foundations, cornerstones of, of my early recovery. Um, you know, so much of my life previously was keeping secrets and hiding and, and so much of it was just lying to myself, which in turn made it so much easier to lie to others. But you know, early in recovery, it was like, I gotta, I gotta connect with others. And I was surrounded by people who showed me the kind of love that, you know, I thought alcohol and drugs were giving me that love, right? So like, you know, being like, yeah, I got bottles and paraphernalia all over my parents' house. And uh, I need someone to help me get rid of that stuff. So this guy uh, went with me to my old elementary school, probably not the smartest place to do this, grabbed a hammer and just started smashing all of my paraphernalia and, you know, cleaned up the glass. Um, 
But that moment for me was like one of those beginning opportunities to be honest with myself, somebody else and, and hold myself accountable. And, um, you know, those, those little tools of, of, you know, getting quiet, getting centered with myself, you, Darren, you were talking about, um, you know, Will Dog having those scary conversations like you were talking about, you know, those are things that have continued to be at the forefront of my recovery. You know, now years later, like uh, to give you an example, December, I, I got hit randomly with like this crazy uh, neurological autoimmune condition that put me in and out of the hospital and had to start making some like, and didn't know what was going on. Doctors couldn't figure it out, had to make some scary medical decisions, some things that were like really tricky to navigate with my recovery, taking certain medications um, just due to the amount of pain that I was enduring. And like Elia is someone who has been uh, a fundamental part of my recovery, someone that like has been such an inspiration to me. And, uh, and I picked up the phone and, and called him and talked to him about what's going on, along with other people in my sober network who have been folks that have held me accountable and, and can like be a shoulder to lean on and at least like someone to talk to. And in some instances, offering some guidance and like suggestions for what I may or may not choose to do to make the right decisions, but I don't have to feel like I'm alone. And even though my, uh, the way in which my addiction, my alcoholism functions in my brain, it's like, I, I want to isolate. I want to go back, you know, like you guys were talking about, I want to like just hide, but I know that when I hide and when I avoid the world and I avoid others, it's, that's one of the scarier, darker places for me. Um, so like early on, you know, getting those good habits ingrained in my recovery were so fundamental and learning to set boundaries. Like if I'm in the studio and someone's like, yo, do you mind if I, I smoke a J or smoke a blunt? I'm like, no problem with that. Do you mind if we just not do it in this space? Can we like step outside to do that? Um, you know, early on when I was tracking an album, I was like, I had to tell my producer, I was like, could you smoke outside rather than in the studio? And today, you know, my boundaries may have shifted somewhat, but being able to just like be honest with myself and be honest with others. And I don't have to be like the tough guy who's like, yeah, I can, you know, do lines of whatever right in front of me. No problem. Um, or I can remove myself, you know, like that's also a choice. And a lot of people like reminded me like, hey, man, like have an exit plan. Um, curious, though, Elliot, because, you know, I know you have just a, a wealth of experience. Um, how, what has your experience been, you know, in present day managing your recovery and being someone in the music world? It's really interesting. You used uh, a term, and, and I'm sort of paraphrasing it here, but I think you said something like sober community or something like that, recovering community. And that's really important to me. That's really, really important to me to have other people I can talk to who understand what it's like to be someone who has dealt with active addiction and someone who still lives with the idea of uh, needing to stay sober on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's foundational. I mean, I was thinking as each of you guys was sharing, and I want to touch on this in a little bit in your experiences, Will and Darren, but for me, service is so much of what keeps me clean and sober. It just is like, you know, what we're doing right now, we're all taking time out of our days, our careers, and we're talking about what's important to us. And hopefully, we're showing other people that it's possible, right? And, you know, like when I put together Sober 21, which I have a copy of right here, I always keep one right on my desk. It's like, this was, you know, what was happening was I was talking to all these musicians who were telling me they were sober and who felt like there weren't other sober musicians out there. So all these guys were trying to get clean guys. I mean, gender neutral. I'm, you know, I use that term in a gender neutral way. All these folks were coming to me saying, I feel so alone. I'm trying to get sober. Who else in music is sober? And I was thinking, Oh, I know hundreds of them, you know? So, you know, on the one hand, we have like Nile Rogers, um, Peter hook from joy division and new order, Patty Shemmel from whole, Mixmaster Mike from Beasties and then younger artists, you know, like Jen Champion and um, Painted Zeros and, 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 and it, doing that service all together. We didn't get paid 
to put together Sober 21. In fact, I donated the money to Music Cares because Music Cares was the one place that I trusted to know how to handle it. And we earmarked it for, I, I call, I had a long conversation with a couple people at Music Cares and we earmarked that money that we got for publishing it through the Creative Independent for folks to go to rehab who were artists and who needed it. And I mean, I'll tell you guys this and then, um, I, you know, I don't want to talk too long on this, but you want to stay sober you go to Rikers to talk. You go to Woodhall Hospital here in Brooklyn, and you go to the flight deck. You know the, the you go to the the detox to talk to those folks in detox. Man, you remember really quick what it's like and what you don't want to go back to. You remember like that, and that stuff for me has been really powerful. And I mentioned earlier the rehab that I went to in Chicago. For years when I lived in Chicago, I'd say for almost a decade, I went in and I shared recovery with the people who were in that program regularly, sometimes weekly, you know, for years at a time weekly. And they would always remind me of where I was when I first came in, you know, afraid, convinced it was never going to work for me, um, worried about being caught up in dealing, which for me was, a, you know, a small time thing, but a real thing for me. and. Um, and, and, and being around the lifestyle. So, boy, I think about service is like the most important thing. And um, I know we don't have too much more time together. One thing I'd love to talk about is the way that service kind of works in, we, we already got to talk about it a little bit with Music Cares. And so I'd love to talk about it in the context of um, music and Ozo Motley and in the context of the Darren Waller Foundation. Um, Darren, you started this foundation back in 2020, a few years ago now, and it focuses on addiction prevention and treatment outreach programs. What does that look like on the ground? Yeah, so uh, we'll start in the Darren Waller Foundation. Let me talk about service. Um, you know, the one of the books we read in, in the meeting I go to, it talks about um, you know, the self-centeredness is the core of my disease and um, is from choice after choice of me choosing to change the way that I felt at the, at the expense of relationships, at the expense of um, responsibilities, at the expense of obligations. And that became my character. Like it was all about me. Whenever I felt something or felt some type of way, I wanted to change how I felt whatever happened to you is whatever happened to you. So that's why service is so powerful because it gets me out of that mode where everything's about me and my world resolves, revolves around what I feel in that moment and how I change it. And now that I don't have to change that the way that I feel, I can experience it and I have other people around me that can relate to it. Now I'm able to direct that energy to service, which is the opposite of the way that I was living in my disease. And that's why I feel like it's so powerful that you decided to talk about it. And that's what prompted me to want to be um, a part of something and leave an impact with my foundation. Um, you know, we provide scholarships for people to go to treatment here in Nevada. And we've surpassed 50 people that have completed 30 days of treatment, um, you know, through relationships that I've formed in Vegas uh, with boots on the ground. You know, they, they're sober livings that they get to go to for aftercare. There are organizations that are getting involved that are helping them transition out of rehab into sober living and into the rest of their lives and not just having them do a 30 day spin cycle and think that that's just going to work for them, but staying committed to them for time. And, um, coming up this summer, we're going to have a event where we go bowling with the people that, com that completed treatment and just like create a fellowship around that. So, um, that's what it's looking like right now. Um, I'm about to move to New Jersey and I know people out there, I know the family ownership of the New York giants is, uh, you know, into helping serve in recovery. So um, I'm, I'm brainstorming on how to, you know, take it over to the East Coast. That's the new challenge um, for me while also maintaining caring for individuals in Nevada because this is home now for me. So, um, but yeah, I love putting boots on the ground mainly because, you know, seeing other people get the gift that was freely given to me and at the same time, it helps me tremendously as well because it keeps me from being uh, in that self-centered state and that's not where I need to be. It's inspirational stuff, man. It really is. And I look forward to welcoming you to the sort of New York area recovery community. It's beautiful yes, that you're coming out here, man. Appreciate and, it. And, uh, you know, Will Dog, also Motley, 
you all have this really long history of community building that goes back all the way to the Peace and Justice Center, you know, which kind of helped form the band um, back in the 90s, a little bit after the L.A. riot uprising. I, I wonder how with you being sober, with multiple people in the band being sober, you all have relationships with your community in terms of recovery. How, how does that look right now? Oh, I mean, the web, the web's wide and big, you know, it's, you know, what's interesting is, uh, I don't know if it's as organized as Darren and that's what we need to do because, uh, well, there's a bunch of us, right. And a bunch of us are involved in so many different, um, you know, foundations, organizations, um, and sometimes those overlap, sometimes they don't, you know, um, it depends. Like if, if the organization needs Ozo Motley, we'll come together. Um, you know, uh, personally right now I'm, you know, on the board of a couple organizations here, um, it more has to do with bringing music into the neighborhoods, um, less on the recovery side, um, but bring, you know, just having access to music and concerts, um, like one of the poorest communities in LA, uh, we, we, you know, we bring uh, 60 concerts there every year into this park, into the park, which is MacArthur Park, which is like, you know, just one of the poorest communities in, in the, the city, really. Um, and then also, uh, and then also recently I've gotten involved in um, working with uh, being a mentor to foster youth. Um, and that's been very, uh, very challenging and very rewarding at the same time. You know, um, that system is really, it's, it's really tough for, for these young people, you know, that are in that system. And, um, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's really tough. And, and so, and for me, it's like, I have like this level of empathy that I think that I didn't have before. I didn't understand, you know, I thought I had it hard or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, we're just, come on, you got to hustle through this. But, but I learned how to hustle, you know, the, like some, some of these kids in the foster system, they, um, you know, there, there's nobody there to teach them how to hustle. They're just getting bounced around. So they're like, you know, just the idea of dealing with, with day-to-day -day life is different than me, you know what I mean? So um, anyways, yeah, so, uh, so that's where I'm at right now. And, and I, I've developed some uh, really strong relationships with some young people um, that I talk to all the time. And some of them are trying to like not talk to me because that's their pattern. And I'm not letting it happen right now. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm on them, you know? Oh, you don't have a phone? Well, here's, I'm bringing you a phone. Now you have a phone, you know? <laughs> like oh i can't call you because i don't have a phone oh yeah you do you know <laughs> like so um and more of it's on like a personal level like that you know where i'm not going to let them you know i'm not going to give up on them you know and that's where i'm at with a couple of them right now you know what i mean and that's it's it's, it's very challenging to, honestly so yeah dude it's amazing i mean one thing when we were putting together sober 21 that jen champion who's a fantastic queer artist said is it feels like we're coming out as sober you know and by being out as sober this work you're doing bringing 60 concerts a year to this community in need by being sober you're also doing sober work even if it's not explicit right it's implicit in the work you do and it's the same for you darren whether you're out on the football field whether you're in the studio i mean and and of course brendan you know, for you, man, everything you do, whether it's being such a central part of music airs or, you know, I mean, I got to see you at the Grammys, man. I got to see you just out and about being a sober, beautiful individual at the Grammys, an example of what can be, you know, if you see it, you can be it. And um, I believe in that deeply. And listen, on that tip, I just want to say, Will Dog, Darren, thank you so much for taking time out and for chopping it up with us today. Man, thank you for having us, bro. It really means a lot. It's just a dope conversation. Yeah, it's Brendan, really great. Thank please. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Brendan, 
a huge thank you to you, man, and to all of Music Cares for uh, partnering with Sober 21 and, and for giving us all a platform to talk about stuff that's really important to us and hopefully can help some other folks out there. So big love, man. Thank you. Thank you.